Hello. Welcome back to the Space Gulag. Today we are doing What If the Blackwing Virus Escaped During the Clone Wars. Before we begin this video, special thanks to our patrons, voice actors, and everyone else a part of the Penty Patrol team. If you want a chance to win a free lightsaber, watch the end of the video, and I'll tell you exactly how you can win. Our story begins on Kamino. It was the second year of combat. The Battle of Kamino had come and gone. The Separatists were beginning to lose their push across the galaxy. Darth Sidious had requested that Lord Tyrannus put in a request that the scientists on Kamino create a bioweapon that could be used once the Clone Wars were over. Lord Tyrannus asked what would the purpose of this be for? Why would the Empire need a bioweapon if the biggest threat were the Separatists and their droid armies, all of which would be shut down after the execution of Order 66? Sidious explained to Dooku that this bioweapon would be able to aid clone troopers in the expansion of the Empire. If the Empire could create a weapon to eradicate planets with rebellious populations, then there would be no concern for the Empire or its troops. It could also be an effective weapon in a time of war if it were to happen, which Palpatine had no intention of having another war. Tyrannus was perfectly fine with this plan and requested that Nala Se begin the production on a bioweapon. Nala Se was the chief medical scientist on Kamino, and she had already been working on a bioweapon of sorts. She intended on having one ready on the off chance that the Republic would need it during the Clone Wars. She was partially done with the project that she was currently calling I-71A. Nala Se was working her way through the project. It really had no issues. She hadn't begun testing on the project yet, because she and her team were consistently working on perfecting it. If they could manage to make the virus more sustainable, then it would become the perfect bioweapon. Nala Se was studying the brain worms that infected a group of clone troopers after the second battle of Genosis. These brain worms had one severe flaw, and it was the fact that they couldn't survive in the cold. There was also an alarming issue that the brain worm struggled with that a bioweapon couldn't afford to struggle with, which was having a continuous transmission, which making it have one could be very difficult. Now let's say needed a virus that could travel from body to body with the efficiency of the casualty rate of a battlefield. If the virus could in a way become the host of an infected individual's body, then it would be perfect. Nala Se had one glaring issue though. She had no one on Kamino she could test it on. Of course she had Omega who was always running around the lab, but one of the other deficient clones would be a good test. Though the only issue is that the deficient clones might react differently than any other host because they were deficient. The thing that was so brilliant about the Genosian brainworms is that they could be transmitted from one being to another without the worry of which being it was infecting. If a bioweapon were to function properly, it had to be transmissible to any type of species across the galaxy, which the brainworm was capable of doing. Nalisa and her team were given the instructions to complete the project for Lord Tyrannus, which helped them find more reason to work on this project. The project was doing well under the radar, but now Nalisa and her team were backed by the best scientists across Kamino. Their studying of the brain worm allowed them to create the perfect virus. But the question was its efficiency. An array of smaller species were brought from around the galaxy. Most of them were different rat types, just to see how the virus functioned before moving the tests to human-like species like a deficient clone trooper. When the virus showed its ability to function within the smaller species, Nala Se and her team noted that there was a foundational point of interest. It was the fact that the virus didn't transmit like a normal virus. While most viruses could transmit through the air particles, surfaces, breathing, physical touch, or an array of different combinations, this particular disease, the I-71A project, was transmitted through the infection of another. While that off the bat doesn't sound anything unlike a normal virus, it really was an infected animal that would develop its disease for a short period of exactly 13.4 seconds, and then when the time was up, the infected animal would develop hunger for another. What was interesting is that while these animals were enclosed in a glass cage, they showed signs of wanting to escape and bite one of the scientists, which meant that this disease could travel from species to species. If the test rats were willing to bite another, then the question is what would they do to a humanoid species? There was also something that they wanted to test, if they wanted to test the effectiveness on the weapon on the creature. When they gassed the rats, it didn't kill them. It was as if the virus itself was immune to chemical warfare, which meant that a population wouldn't be able to be stopped if it were gassed. The next phase of testing was testing on a humanoid, so they brought in a dysfunctional clone and threw him into one of the training facilities. There was also a lab rat put in a cage in front of him. One of the scientists walked into the room and planted the syringe in the clone's back, and then ran into the elevator shaft as it closed up. From the top, Nala Se and her scientists looked down at the massive screen covering the every move that the infected clone would make. 13.4 seconds ticked away, and the clone started to contort his body. Its eyes lifted into a pale look, and its mouth began to foam out. The clone immediately became interested in the rat that was 
in his cage, as it ripped the cage open and took a massive bite out of the rat and killed it. The clone didn't finish the rat though, it threw the body and remained dormant, standing still without thought or without motive. The scientists decided that they would throw another clone into the arena, but on the other side. It was another defective clone, so there was nothing to worry about. When the clone entered the arena, he looked across the way and saw one of his buddies. All the defective clones knew each other, and they were all really close. The clone called out to his friend as the infected clone went from dormant to aggressive. Something was even more impressive, and the scientists noticed that the defective clone showed an increased mobility. His mobility went from defective to bad batch levels. It was rather impressive. The infected clone ran over, and the clone who called his name asked how he was running so fast, until the infected clone laughed up into the air and bit at his neck. The defective clone cried out in pain as he felt his neck be ripped apart. The infected clone continued on, eating until another clone was thrown into the mix, and the first infected clone abandoned the one that he was currently eating and went for the other. The scientists were able to report that the I-71A was able to not only enhance the mobility of a given number of its infected patients, but even more that, the virus was more interested in continuous spread rather than feasting on an already infected member. The second clone then rose with a gaping wound in its neck and looked around. The scientists all applauded their work, but the next step was to see how efficient blasters were against these beings. So the training droids were activated, and then they shot hundreds of rounds into the patients 1 through 3. It seemed to be efficient, and there seemed to be nothing wrong with the test. It seemed as if the Project I-71A was ready for bioweapon usage. The real question was if Tyrannus would want it now. Regardless, considering the infected were dead, the scientists requested that the other defective clones come pick up these bodies and release them into the oceans of Kamino. Within a matter of 20 minutes, the crew clones would walk into the room, and they would get everything together and started picking up the bodies and placing them on the little carts to carry them out. The droids were put away and the clones were carried off, and the infected clones were taken to the drop-off area as they were instructed. Nalase and her team took off their findings to their Prime Minister so that they could inform him of everything they uncovered. Their discoveries were proper and it seemed as if everything was going to be perfect in order for Lord Tyrannus the next time they were in contact with him. On the lower levels of Topoka City, the defective clones took the bodies of their brothers and dropped them each down into a drop-off area, though one of the three bodies came to life all of a sudden and bit his brother on the hand. The defective clone naturally kicked it off and thought he was imagining things, and then he slowly began to feel uneasy. His vision got blurry and he pressed the release button. The defective clone placed his hand on his head, as he felt everything was spinning. He looked at his brothers next to him, telling them that he didn't feel right. The other two defective clones looked at their brother and reached out to him. After 13.4 seconds, he leapt forward and bit into their arms and into their necks before running into the next room. The two other defective clones cried out in pain as their bodies began to contort on the ground, and then, a few short moments later, they too ran out of the room. Unluckily for the cadets that were studying in the room adjacent, they heard the screaming as one of the Kaminoan instructors opened the corridor to find out what the noise was. When she came around the corner, she was lifted off of her feet and bitten. The entire lecture hall was caught in a shock, as every student turned around from their pods, and the other instructor did the same, as they all looked at what just happened. The other two infected clones followed in as the three of them began their attack. The boys in the room all screamed out in terror, as their instructor's blood covered the floor, and the screaming of her pale voice was slowly drowned out by the terror of her students. The first cadets were caught quickly. Those by the other exit began to run in terror. The closest armory was a level up, and they had to escape to get up there. These infected clones leapt forward and then slowly but surely, their cadet brothers and instructors began to join in as the infected started hunting down the screaming children. The current level was full of lecture halls and every hall heard the terror. As their doors began to open, groups of the undead would pile through, making their mark and biting into those who were not yet infected. Terror filled the lower levels of Topoka City. The city was massive. There was no one reporting an issue anywhere though. The cadets, who were able to get up to the next level, decided instead of calling for help to take the fight into their own hands. This was a tragic misstep. In the clone barracks, several squads of clones had just come back from their training sessions. The squad training sessions were essential to clone troopers. This training helped each of them in every aspect of battle, and allowed them to contribute as best they could to their squad mates on the battlefield. The men were sweaty, tired, and ready for their cleanup. While well, the batch that was out came back and another batch of troopers were making their way to the training area, this particular squad was the best of their class. The five members were Terror, Seventy, Grey, Sharpshot, and Gems. 
The squad was extremely tight. They all walked out of the barracks, and they were the first squad up today in their training. They walked through the hallways. Everything was as normal as ever for them. They were the first squad to get into training grounds because they were the best, and they got to go first because they were the best. The ARC troopers were currently on base, and they were overseeing the training of this batch of troopers. The clones entered the training facility, and they were ready for combat. This was their time to complete the Citadel Challenge in front of the ARC troopers. It was all set in stone, and then it began. The squad jumped out into combat, and they began shooting at the droids that were placed throughout the facility. The squad was known as the Wreckers. They accepted the name, and they bulldozed their way through the Citadel Challenge. They got the most important part, the climb. Within three minutes, the Wreckers were able to climb the Citadel and beat the time of the best squad previously, a new record. The clones were proud of themselves, as they got down from the Citadel and took their helmets off preparing to watch the squad after them. When they looked up, they didn't see the Ark Troopers, Shakti, or the Kaminoans, who were overwatching their progress when they first began. It was a bit weird, but it wasn't uncommon for it to happen from time to time. The squad mates were laughing with each other. Terra told the group that it was one more test and it was off to the front lines. Gems, who was essentially the leader of the group, nodded his head and laughed while Sharpshot walked next to him with a grin across his face. Gray walked up and tapped the switch to open up the elevator. It was empty. Again, this was rather peculiar, but no matter. They hopped into the elevator and began to take it down to the structure. The five of them talked with each other about their plans for when they finished training. The doors of the elevator opened up, and they all saw panic in the corridors. Clones, Kaminoans, cadets, they were all running. The five squad members looked outside in shock. All they heard was screaming. Gems told the group to set their weapons for blasters as they looked around the corner and saw nothing but their brothers. All of a sudden, Gray was ripped to the ground as he screamed out in pain, begging his other brothers to help him. Terror kicked the trooper who was on top of him off of him, and it was another one of their brothers. The infected clone leaped up and shoved Terror to the back of the elevator. Gems turned around and unloaded into the back of the infected clone. Terror looked at his brother with fear all across his face. Gems turned around and it seemed as if there was an infection of some sort ravaging through the clones. Sharpshot closed the elevator as he told them that it was best chance for survival was setting up inside the citadel until they got a grasp on the situation. It was too chaotic in the hallways. They couldn't know who was their brother and who was infected. The elevator began to climb up into the citadel arena. And then all of a sudden, Terror began to snap crack as he leapt across the elevator and bit a chunk out of Jim's neck. Sharpshot screamed out trying to stop his brother, but then his hand was bitten, and without a moment of hesitation, Seventy shot his blaster rifle into Terror's back. Gems and Sharpshot looked at each other, and they knew that they could become infected. Seventy asked what they were doing, but before they could answer, Sharpshot and Gems brought their blasters around towards their heads and pulled the trigger. Seventy cried out, begging them to know why they would do this. His entire squad was killed before his eyes. Seventy tumbled out of the elevator and fell to the ground. His armor was covered in the blood of his brothers. Seventy wanted to know why this was all happening, and all around him all he could hear was screaming, and then blaster fire followed by explosions. Clones yelled out as they were cut down by the undead. The hallways were filled with terror and screaming. Clones ran away, but it was to no avail. None of them had any of their equipment ready, and none of them were ready for the undead to rise up. For the clones that were being sent to the medical facilities or the front lines, were the most at worry. The hangar bays were currently full of transports ready to go to two different vessels. The biggest issue at Topoka City is that no one knew what was happening until it was too late. The zombie hordes were crushing their way through the hallways, and there weren't any signs of them stopping. For the clones getting to the landing docks, everything was still silent. There was a cruiser getting ready to ship off to a medical facility in the mid-rim, and there was also a Venator-class star destroyer getting ready to take the troops back to Coruscant. From Coruscant, these troops would be divided up into the Coruscant Guard, the 501st, the 41st Elite Corps, the 212th, and 327th Sky Corps. All of them were waiting for the last few LATs to be loaded up into the hangar bay, and then they would take their troops back to Coruscant. The hallways inside of the Keminoan facilities were covered in blood. Those who weren't directly infected died from the wounds, and even worse, those who were able to defend themselves had to look at their brothers and execute them. Topoka City was a massacre of the worst kind, and the inflicted wounds were from the brothers. Inside the hangar bay, the clones loaded up their final vessels as the LAATs filled with troopers. All of a sudden, the doors were opened and screaming could be heard. The men of the loading docks looked over as clones were covered in blood as they ran away. Some of them had their helmets on. Others were wearing the mandatory black uniforms. Those with armor on had good protection, but they were still vulnerable. 
The men that piled into the hangar bay called out, demanding that the LATs be launched into the air. Behind them was a swarm of the undead. They looked like their brothers, and they used to be, but their eyes were covered in white, and their disgruntled behavior was not that of a normal human being. The clones loaded up into the LATs. There were those loading into a shuttle for the medical frigate, and they all got out of the hangar bay. Everything seemed to be alright. The LATs made their way from the hangar bay of the Venator class Star Destroyer, as those left behind in Topoka City were abandoned, left to the plague that no one knew was coming. Some of them had to watch their brothers pull away from them, out of the hangar bay, just to be eaten from behind. There were thousands of clones on Kamino, at least a hundred thousand, even at this point during the war. This loss of life would be catastrophic for the clone army. As the LAATs loaded into the hangar bay, everyone unloaded as they went to inform the captain that there was something wrong on Kamino. One of the LAATs pilot got out of his ship without opening the locks. He yelled out telling some other men that he thought there was something wrong with his group. A squad of clones came over and asked what he meant. The clone trooper took off his helmet. All he could hear was screaming from the back of his ship through the comms. He said his ears were ringing from the pure terror that came out of them. The clone squad told him to get to the bridge and inform the captain that there might be a loose end on the vessel, and withhold the ship from going into hyperspace. The pilot nodded his head as he made his way to the bridge. Though the medical vessel and the Venator were already making their way to their respective locations, both launched into hyperspace. Why wouldn't they? No one was able to make communication that the undead were ravaging through Toboka City. Sure, the communications from the city had been quiet, but the Blackwing virus made its way through the entire facility so quickly, no one had time to react. Not the Bounty Hunters, not the Kaminoans, the Clones, nor Jedi Master Shock T. As far as anyone knew, there was no survivors on Kamino. But also, no one knew there was anyone dead on Kamino. The power grid of the facility seemed to be down. To the captains of the ships, this wasn't exactly uncommon. The storms of Kamino were so powerful that it wasn't too regular for the entire power grid to go down from time to time. It's why Kamino had red lighting that lined the inside of his halls of the structure. Those were red lights that were there to conserve the energy and use the energy when the power went out. The Venator jumped to hyperspace, and the medical frigate also jumped to hyperspace. Inside of the medical vessel, the shuttle landed, and the pilot opened up the bay doors. As he looked into the bay of the shuttle, he flew up to the medical frigate, and was confused to find the entire vessel full of blood. He then heard screaming as he stepped out to investigate the hallways of the medical ship. When the clone turned the corner, he was smacked in the face with a zombie that dragged him to the ground, and shredded his helmet as his face was bitten violently. The cockpit of the medical facility was locked down as the pilot caught word of the chaos traveling through the small vessel. On the Venator, the clone pilot came to the bridge as he realized the ship was in hyperspace. He tried to inform the captain that there was an issue, but the captain shushed him, as he and his team were looking at the hangar bay cameras. The grounds of the hangar bay were littered with bodies and, even more, soaked in blood. It seemed as if the LAT, the pilot that flew up to the ship, had infected others and they had escaped the vessel. The captain sounded the alarm to put all the clones into high alert. Sirens blared throughout the Venator class Star Destroyer as clones began running to the barracks to get their weapons ready. Though it seemed to be for nothing, as a swarm began to spread faster and faster, much faster than it did on Camino. The tight corridors of the Venator filled with blaster fire, holes, explosions. The clones were unsuspecting. Within an hour, the entire Venator was locked down. But it didn't matter. Every single clone on the inside of the vessel was dead or infected. It was the same time for the medical frigate as it arrived out of hyperspace of the medical facility in the mid-rim. These facilities were placed across the galaxy to keep wounded clones who were from the front lines away from combat, but also put safely so that they could recover and be shipped out to the front lines. When the medical frigate arrived, its comms weren't working, so the general on base requested that the group of shuttles go out and guide it in. Ever since the Genosha's brainworm issue, new ships were created to have stronger tractor beams that could shut down the engines of any given vehicle so that they wouldn't crash into a medical station. The tractor beam vessels spread out and they were able to safely guide the medical frigate into the landing bay. The medical facility had been expecting this vessel because it was carrying supplies from Camino that it needed. When the doors opened, it was eerily silent. It was like the entire crew disappeared. The Jedi and a group of clones entered the medical frigate and within 10 minutes, they made enough noise to awaken the dead, as they were easily overrun. The medical facility would be functional, but within a matter of hours, everyone inside the facility was gone. As for the Venator, when it arrived out of hyperspace, it couldn't be stopped, as it slammed into the Admiral's flagship of a Coruscant, creating a massive explosion that would detonate the Admiral's flagship and cause severe damage to the closest ships in formation. Without any proof of the undead, it was assumed that it was a Separatist plot. 
though the Separatists had no knowledge of this. Republic officials on Coruscant noted that they lost communication with Kamino, and the Jedi Temple wasn't able to get into contact with Jedi Master Shakti. Because this wasn't off the top of their heads as a massive issue, a local commando squad would be sent to Kamino to check in on the facility and discover why it wasn't transmitting any frequency. It seemed as if the entire planet had gone dark, and both vessels last reported to leave the planet had either crashed into the another ship or arrived at a medical facility, which had also lost its power and was no longer transmitting a frequency. This all seemed a bit weird, so the Republic, instead of sending an army, dispatched two squads. Delta Squad was dispatched to Kamino, and Omega Squad was dispatched to the medical facility in the mid-rim. When Delta Squad arrived at Kamino, it was noticeably eerie. Delta Shuttle couldn't land in the hangar bays because it was all too dark. It was the middle of the night, after all. The rain poured down heavily. Boss told Fixer to keep the ship's engines on. Something didn't feel right. Delta Squad exited their ship into the rain. They all turned on their visors to night vision when they walked out, and they saw a clone on deck. He wasn't moving. He was just standing there motionless. For Boss, he found this to be a bit odd, so he stepped lightly as he tried to get the clone's attention. Boss then told the squad to silence their weapons in case there was something foul at play here. Boss tapped the clone's shoulders and the rain masking the sounds of his boots as he walked. The clone turned around and leapt at Boss as he whipped his arm around and a small shiv smashed into the side of the clone's face as he pushed him away. The squad ran over to make sure Boss was okay. When the squad got there, they looked down at the clone and realized he looked to be rather abnormal. Of course, besides the gash in the side of his head from the little blade, his face was covered in blood, and his forearm, between the pieces of armor, was a massive bite mark. Boss told Sev to scout the area, not to leave the perimeter, but to set a trap. There seemed to be an issue larger than anything currently on Camino. Sev scouted as he took his rifle out and examined everything. Boss told Scorch to put detonators on the two platforms connecting to where they were, so they could blow the bridges if they needed to be completely secure from whatever was here. At the same time, Fixer took out some samples of the deceased clone and brought them aboard the shuttle. If they could get any more information, it'd be helpful. The best location to go would be Nalisei's office. She had all the information. The only issue is that her office was in the middle of the facility. It would require Delta Squad to get down there without running into one of thousands of dead. Once the detonators were placed in the area and the area was scouted, Boss threw the body into the sea just in case it came back to life. Delta regrouped as they made their way across to the adjacent platform to begin their approach into Topoka City. With their night vision on, they could see everything they needed to see. But there was an unknown fear. The lights of the facility were either off, in red mode, or flickering. The four clones of Delta Squad tiptoed around the corner and opened up the side entrance into the hangar bay. There wasn't a sign of anyone else inside of the facility. But they got a better view, and they saw something horrifying. The entire bay was littered with bodies, blood, organs. The four clones moved slowly around. Scorch asked Boss what he thought it might be. Fixer looked from side to side as Sev took the lead. Boss expressed that he assumed it was some sort of skin-eating parasite. It was the only thing that would make plausible sense. Other than that, it could be a bioweapon of sorts. That was why they were here, and that's why they were heading to Nalise's office. If it was a bioweapon indeed, then it would need to find a cure, found before the disease spread out across the galaxy. Boss requested that the images be saved, as Fixer nodded his head, telling him that he was already on it. Sev crept forward, avoiding stepping on anything, as he searched for the lights. When he got to the panel, he found a clone on the ground, completely torn apart. This wasn't the work of a skin parasite. Sev saw that the doors into the main facility were opened up a little. As he walked over, he waved his team over as well. Sev almost fell off his feet, and when the rest of the squad arrived, they almost did the same thing. The Kaminoan hallways were filled with the undead. Scorch looked them all down, seeing an issue with each and every single one of the clones. It was very noticeable. These clones all had bite marks. Whether it was a cadet, a trooper, they were all infected. Same with the Kaminoans. Delta Squad knew that they couldn't fight this many troopers off. There had to be another way down to the office. Boss pointed up and reminded the men of the ventilation shafts. They would get to use the hallway at some point, but this would get them halfway there. They had to be on their best during the mission. If they made any obscene noises, then it could be very possible that this would be their last mission. As they entered the ventilation shaft, Boss told Fixer to dispatch a signal to the Jedi Temple and to the Republic Military Complex and to the Senate Building. This signal was essentially a live stream so that everyone could see what the clones were seeing. Whoever was watching would know what happened to Kamino, in case Delta Squad didn't escape. Right now, it looked like the clones across the entire facility were infected. 
the live stream broadcasted and the clones returned to their mission. Another trap was set at the entrance of the room, as the clones rose up into the ventilation shaft. As they crawled along, they saw everything from cadets, defective clones, the Kaminoans, regular clones, all throughout the facility. The clones were all infected. Delta Squad then saw something. It was a group of cadets. They were hiding in the barracks. Everything was well and fine until one of them tripped off and fell out of one of the bunks. The sound got the attention of the undead as they all ran into the room. The children screamed in terror as they tried to shoot and fight their way out. They tried to run as well, but the swarm ran over them. And all that could be heard was the screaming and their pleas for mercy under the weight of the zombies who rushed them. Delta Squad watched in horror and those inside of the Jedi Temple watched this happen. The squad of clones continued, and in one of the main hallways, they got a look at true horror. This hallway oversaw all the major training facilities on Topoka City. There were academic rooms, training halls, and all the clones could see were dead. They also saw Shock T wandering amongst the dead, and then below her, there were hundreds of thousands of clones wandering around. Every one of those clones were seemingly infected, though they were not really moving, they were just kind of dormant. There were at least a hundred thousand clones inside of Topoka City and this seemed to be most of them. Delta carried on. The building creaked and croaked. The sounds of the undead didn't necessarily help either. On top of everything, the lights continued to be dimly lit. An explosion sounded off. Delta looked through the vents as they watched a squad of clone troopers try and make an escape. Another explosion went off as they pushed. There was about 10 clones. Scorch tried to get them to help, but Sev quieted them down. There was not a chance that they could sacrifice their mission. Delta had to go forward. They could not get risk of getting caught in this predicament. Not without the research they needed. These clones could have used the ventilation shafts, but instead, were the perfect distraction. One of the clones was then thrown across the hallway. Fixer looked back and whispered to the rest of his squad, telling them to keep an eye on Shock T. She was much more powerful as an undead being, much more powerful than the clones. The screams of the clones could be heard echoing through the hallways as Delta got the corridor they were meant to be in and dropped down. Boss reminded everyone to have their weapons set for silence. They all understood the orders as they slowly descended into the hallway. After checking both sides, Boss and Sev covered the opposite ends of the hallway as they got down. Fixer was informed to run to the opposite edge of the hallway and steal the door. It was a precaution for when they were coming back. Sev at the same time would set up a ladder for them to access if they were in a rush trying to get out. Scorch and Boss walked along the hallway to the opposite side of the hallway and placed detonators on the sides of the walls. This would also help them if they were trying to run away. Once everyone finished their tasks, the squad was on the move again. Fixer suggested sticking to melee combat, but Boss told them that they needed to be quick. They didn't have time to find out how the others got infected. Delta Squad stuck together as they held a tight formation, each having each other's backs as they passed their night vision to traverse the hallways. Delta came across a hallway full of these zombies. Scorch rounded the corner and sealed off the exit as fast as he could. Though, there was a tool that fell from his belt, and from the corner of Sev's eyes he could see the undead coming as he whipped around and blasted away at the dead coming for him. Fixer and Boss turned around and saw a wave of zombies coming for them. Scorch walked fast as the rest of Delta Squad worked hard to defend each other. The zombies were killed off and the squad continued forward. This was a high stress mission, as the clones sealed off another hallway and continued down the main one. Boss noted that Nalase's office was right ahead. Once they got in there, they could set up camp for the moment, and they'd be ready for the next time they had to fight off these zombies. Delta pushed forward, creeping past halls full of clone zombies. There had to be others still alive inside the facility, but there was nothing they could do about it. Delta Squad pushed forward, leaving traps wherever they could. These traps would make great diversions to avoid the hordes of zombies. Once Delta arrived in Nalase's office, they locked themselves inside of the facility and looked around for any information they could get. Across the galaxy, the Senate, the Republic military structure, and the Jedi would watch the stream with great interest. Palpatine was a little worried, though, that they might find out information about Lord Tyrannus. Nalase was brilliant, but she wasn't exactly great about staying secretive. She left her trail wide open, and that was likely because of the quick exit she had to make. Regardless, Delta began to sort through the information. In the mid-rim, the medical facility Omega Squad was dispatched to was in panic. They were currently running away from hordes of zombies. They had done everything right. It was an accident that alerted the zombies to their presence. They didn't have their silencers on. It was because they didn't realize how the zombies reacted to noise. Omega Squad was on the run because they had no other choice. Unlike Kamino, there wasn't a great place for Omega Squad to distance themselves from these zombies. Instead, Omega Squad was forced into immediate combat. This medical facility was in worse condition than Kamino because everyone inside was either a doctor or some sort of wounded or individual. Because everyone inside of the facility was either a doctor or some sort of wounded or injured individual. 
which meant that the wounded and injured had no chance to escape as they watched Terra descend onto them. Omega Squad ran through the halls. One of their squad members, while running, was able to hack into the mainframe of the system. If they could get back to their ship, they could detonate the entire facility. It wasn't going to be easy, a clone killing all of his own brothers, but it had to be done. It was life or death. Omega Squad made its way through the facility and were able to get their way back to the vessel. Omega Squad wasn't broadcasting a signal, so they were just on a move. The squad blasted their way and threw bombs to clear a path. There was a reason Omega Squad and Delta were sent. They were some of the best of the commando squads in the Republic, and the fight they were fighting was extremely stressful. Their four squad members positioned themselves specifically to keep themselves going. One of the four members got into a hallway and detonated the wall that led into space, which would suck out the zombies that were following them. Omega then rounded some corners and got back to their ship. Their mission was to return the Coruscant with the information that was from the medical facility. When they got their ship, they left the station and the entire station was set for detonation. When Omega Squad jumped into hyperspace, the station exploded behind them. Back on Kamino, after hours of research and hard work, it seemed as if Delta came up with all the information they needed for the Republic. They prepared themselves for an escape. As they turned the corner and ran, Towards a loudspeaker, they had a brilliant idea. Scorch got into the microphone and broadcasted it to the opposite edge of the building. When he did, he turned the volume up all the way and made a call with the most rambunctious things he could say. The squad then made their way on the move, back to the ventilation shafts. All they could hear was the echoing noises of the undead. Delta made their way back to the ventilation shaft as they made sure they could escape back to Coruscant with all the information they got from Malice's office. The information was extremely valuable. Once they got to the ventilation shafts, it was a straight shot. All the undead were walking into the opposite direction, and Delta Squad was pretty much safe. As Delta walked to the vents, Fixer's leg got caught into a hole as he fell down and it filled into the hallway. Fixer panicked as Boss turned around and pulled Fixer out, but it was too late. He was pulled out, and one of the zombies got a hold of his foot and bit it. Sev pushed Boss out of the way and into the wall of the vent as he cut off Fixer's foot. Sev started to count as the three commanders pulled Fixer away from the hole that he fell through. Fixer was in an excruciating amount of pain, but he bit his lip until it began to bleed, as to not cause the zombies to find them. After 13.4 seconds, everything seemed to be alright. It worked, but they needed to go. When Delta got back to the hangar bay, Sev and Scorch picked Fixer up and carried him. Boss held his weapon out, holding cover fire for the squad. There was no zombies, everything seemed to be fine as they loaded up into their ship and lifted off from the facility as Scorch fixed up Fixer and Sev and Boss piloted the ship into hyperspace. Everything seemed fine. After hours, Delta would arrive back on Coruscant and see everything in chaos. Omega Squad came back, and they were specially ordered, just like Delta, to come back to the Senate building. But when they landed, an undead clone was in the storage capsule of the shuttle and broke out. The Senate building was just the beginning. The Jedi and the Coruscant Guard were making a stop, especially with LAATs and the readiness to strike back, but there was an incredible amount of chaos. The public was encouraged to stay inside. The streets of Coruscant were filled with death, and the Jedi were doing as best they could to stop everything that was happening. When Delta arrived, there was immediate stress. The Senate building was filled with death as well. The Jedi were able to make their way through and save the Chancellor, but most of the Senators were killed by the zombie outbreak. Luckily, the outbreak was being put away, and the city was starting to be filled with peace, though there was a looming issue. The clones lost more than a third of their army at Kamino, the medical facility in the mid-rim, and on Coruscant. With the Senate mostly wiped out, there was also issue on how they would fill those roles. Luckily, Padme was one of those few senators still alive. The outbreak of what was being titled around the galaxy as Blackwing was traced back to Lord Tyrannus, which the Republic would identify as Count Dooku. Because of the information retrieved from Delta Squad, an investigation would begin, led by the Jedi into the creation of the clone army. And because Topoka City was still functional, an entire group of elite Jedi would sneak into the city on Kamino, and they would go through the entire city's historical information. The Jedi did this without permission from the Senate, and they did it before Venator was sent to obliterate the entire facility at Topoka City. The Jedi would find out everything they needed to regarding the creation of the clone army. Though what they found was all terrible. The information would, instead of being presented to the Republic Senate, would be presented to the Separatist Senate. The Jedi knew they couldn't trust the Republic Senate, because all the roles of Senators were filled by Palpatine. But the information the Jedi found proved that Palpatine was behind the Clone Wars, and that Dooku was his apprentice. For the Jedi, it was the right move, because it would prohibit the Separatists from continuing the war effort, seeing it as a ploy for Palpatine to gain more power. The Clone Wars would grind to a complete halt, and the Separatists and the people of the Republic would have two enemies, both of which would be captured and held before public execution for their crimes against the galaxy, proving even more that the darkness of the Sith was timeless. 
The study found that Dooku and Sidious were behind not just the Clone Wars, but the creation of the Clone Army, the dispute over Naboo, the death of Jedi Master Sifo Dyas, and the creation of Blackwing. It seemed to the people of the galaxy, as the Jedi placed their evidence, that the Sith were going to use Blackwing to exterminate the Trillions. This wasn't exactly true. The evidence the Jedi had and were bringing to light aided this train of thought, though. And while the Seppis and the Republic had their disagreements, they saw the war as the wrong choice, especially judging on the way that it went and what it did to the galaxy. Two years and billions of lives lost. It could be fixed, and it could be resolved. The unison between the Separatists and the Republic would come with a new model of power that held the Chancellor and his or her advisors extremely under watchful eyes. There was nothing that the Chancellor could do that couldn't go unnoticed. While the end of Blackwing did come, there was a fear of its possible revival, and so a vaccination would be made that could be used in case Blackwing ever manifested again. The galaxy would find itself in peace eventually, but it would be very difficult. Maul would show up again, but instead of Obi-Wan going to Mandalore alone, he would go with Anakin, because there were no more boundaries. With the Clone Wars over, Anakin and Obi-Wan would be able to kill Maul and Savage and save Duchess Satine. For years to come, the Republic would find itself and fight for itself. It would be strenuous, but it would eventually find a new era of High Republic. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our Halloween special. Happy Halloween, everybody. Special thanks to Ben Wells, Icy Raptor, Apollo, Madmana Studios, Anakin003, and Gort for supporting the channel. Uh, Listen to thousand likes on this. We're going to do part two for Finn tomorrow. I finally finished the story and I finally got the thumbnail, so I'm excited to hand that one out to you guys. If you want to see what if, let me know below. I read our comments, but I don't do crossovers. Check out the Twitch, community, Discord, and Patreon. If you want to support me in other ways, for the free lights, you go down below. There's a doc. You click on the doc, you write your name on the doc. Subscribe. We're going for 50,000 subscribers. We are 10,000 away. Thank you for 40,000 subscribers. Let's keep going. We're on the roll now. Let's keep doing it, my friends. And um, let's talk about our story. So, also, one other thing, I don't give away lightsabers in the comments, I give away lightsabers in videos, okay? Don't pay attention, that's a scam artist. I've been blocking them, if you see them, just report them, it's not me. Um, I report them every time I see it, but YouTube doesn't protect us all the time, so uh, sorry about that. Uh, let's talk about our story here. Um, this was fun, uh, this was a fun story, this was uh, a, horror, a horror story, obviously, um, and I think, it was, I think it was fun, I mean... The, the story is all meant to be in, in fun, um, and I think I think it's it's basically your your traditional zombie story, right? It's bad, it gets worse, and then it gets better, right? And it's kind of hard to do it with a galaxy full of people. So in my mind, the zombies that were in this were not like your traditional zombies. I'm thinking World War Z type of zombies, those psycho things, like like really like crazy. Um, and that's, I thought that'd be more fun to do, and I didn't specifically say that because I can't really, in the middle of a video, be like, oh yeah, these are the World War Z zombies. I kind of wanted that to be up for your interpretation, um, and then at the end of the story, I kind of tell you where my thoughts are. Um, but my, my thought process were the World War Z, World War Z zombies because they were much more scary. Um, if, if that was a thing, I would, I would, I would delete myself. I would not, I would not do that. The World War Z zombies, I'm fast, but I am, I am not dealing with that. That is, like shell shock like I those things are fast and I'm fast and I don't need that like <laughs> um, and so that's kind of what I was going here with is like there's really fast Nami's and that that the ignorance of, of trying to create a weapon would would do this and you know see however you want I I thought this was fun um, this was all in good fun for Halloween I thought it'd be a good a good video to do because it's kind of spooky you know I can't do like Dracula and Star Wars or something but you know I thought doing zombies in Star Wars would be fun because we've seen it happen before in, in Legends and I think bringing it back for in our current ca canonical timeline I thought that would be fun. Uh, I didn't want the Jedi to be in this, I really wanted the story to focus on on the individual horror aspect of it which was the whole point of this story um, and I wanted to focus on the individual terror that the clones would go through. Um, rather than a galaxy-wide terror. Yes, the Jedi would be involved, and I think the Jedi would, would get caught by it, but I think I think on, on Kamino, it's much more difficult to contain. Everything's inside, so if they're inside, you cannot contain that like as well as you could if they were outside. On Coruscant, I think they would be able to contain it, um, and that's kind of the difference I was talking about. Like, yes, Coruscant is going to be a massacre. Like, yes, probably a couple million people are going to get died. Like, they're going to die. Probably a million maybe a couple hundred million, a lot of people are going to die on Coruscant. That's kind of the main point. But it'd be able to be stopped. On Kamino, you're not stopping that. There's just no stopping that. There, it's a closed-off facility with, like, 
50,000 to 100,000 clones, right? And I, I believe that it would actually stall the war effort. I think the Republic would be like, oh my goodness, we lost all of our clones. You know, a whole group of clones were about to go to the front line. Uh, this is really not good. And I think that that would really stifle the Republic in the war effort. But overall, I hope you enjoyed the story. I hope it was spooky and I hope you got some good candy for Halloween. I love you all my friends. Have a great one. Drive safe if you're driving. Stay safe. There's a bunch of psychos out on the road today. Happy Halloween. I love you all. Spread the love and always remember my friends, may the force be with you.